deception is growing in the church. You might say, well, pastor, uh, I mean, I can see it growing in the world. No, no, no. The world's already deceived. The world's already deceived by the great deceiver. But the problem is not that the world is deceived. The problem is, is that the church is being deceived because deception is growing more and more in the church through the gospel of relativity. And I call it that, the gospel of relativity. Whenever the word of God is reduced to how a person feels and according to a person's circumstances, instead of the sovereignty, the absoluteness of God's word, no matter the circumstance, no matter the person, then there's a problem and it's called deception. You see, God's word is not a respect to a person's. It's not. It's, that means it's not a respecter of your particular situation or circumstance because God's word is the truth regardless of your circumstance or your situation. He's still the only way, the only truth, and the only life. He's still the only one who can declare to, to you that his word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. He's the only one to declare unto you that when you look to him, and when you lean on him, he will not only direct your steps, he will ordain your steps. He will enable you. He will empower you. He will not only instruct you, he will equip you. Will the challenges be there? Will the tribulations be there? Will all the things that come against a true, genuine believer be there? Yes, yes, yes. But God's power is greater than all the other yeses of the world. God's truth does not become less truth because we're more modernized. In fact, it becomes greater now than ever before. And the word of God well says that. It says, in the wisdom of the world, I will show them foolishness. Or in the foolishness of the world, will I produce wisdom. How will we do that? By the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm here today to tell you that revival will not be staunched. True revival will not be hyped up. It will not be advertised. It will be had. It will be enveloped. It will be a thing that happens so greatly and so completely and so fully that a person will not be able to say, no, wait a minute, Lord, I, I, didn't, I didn't sign on for this. Either you sign on or you sign out. But God's not going to play with it. God wants to do a work in us and he will do a work in all those who are available. Not the most talented, not the wisest, not the most intellectual, not those who have it all together, not the greatest churches, not those who have all the money, not those who have all the looks, not those who have all the stuff. But God says when you have me, you don't need any other stuff. You got me. The word of God spoke to Jeremiah the prophet. He said, there's a problem with the prophets and the priests and all the leaders of God, all the leaders in the word of God for the people of God prophesy like things. There's a problem with that. He said, I haven't sent them. And yet when people speak the word of God, when pastors speak the word of God to their congregation and they say, this is what the word of God says to do, but you know, That's when your yay and nay comes in. That your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Because anytime you start playing with the yes of God and the no of God, you start playing with your emotions and you start leaning into relativity. And well, you know what I mean by relativity, don't you? When, when the word of God doesn't affect you because it's not, I mean, that's not the circumstances that the word of God is speaking to. God doesn't quite know that, you know, you're having a difficulty here, a difficulty there. But God's word says, I'm not a respectful person. Does God's word then? Are we to add to God's word? Are we to take away from God's word? Father God, I just thank you for the day, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that you, you've caused a fire, a holy fire in me to rise up concerned deception is growing in the church and it's under the lie of relativity Father God I pray Lord for each and every one of my brothers here that I see that are here that are not here I pray for those Father God who may be watching this video I pray that all is well for each one of them Lord and Father God I pray this morning 
as always, as we welcome them here, Lord God. May the Holy Spirit continue to lead us into all truth. That's my prayer. Lead us into all truth. Not me, but the Holy Spirit. Because me or any other pastor or any other believer that walks outside of God's truth is in error, to say it mildly. But when you cause that error to be another gospel and you cause many to stumble, God will deal with you on that because of what you cause others, especially as a teacher of God's word. It says, let not many of you be teachers because of the greater judgment concerning that. And believe me, I know that. Uh, foundational readings this morning are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10, 1 through 14. As your major text reading, and your text will be found in that. Also, I want you to write down these, and we'll move quickly, and then we'll, we'll touch on the ones that need to be touched on the others you read at home and study. That's Isaiah 5, verses 20 through 21, and verse 23. Jeremiah 17, 5 from 10. Matthew 24, verses 11 through 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 17. And 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Does anyone need for me to repeat any of that? Let me go through them. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 14 is your text reading, plus it houses your text. Isaiah 5, 20 through 21, and then verse 23. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. Matthew 24, verses 11 through 13. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 through 22, Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 17, and 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Your theme today is this, deception is an equal opportunity employer. So take heed. Deception is an equal opportunity employer. So take heed. What I mean by that is that anyone can be deceived if you allow the word to be removed from its sovereignty and its absolute truth. When you start allowing the word of God to be hidden, this thing in your life, when you start allowing the word of God to be relative or non-relative, depending on how comfortable you are in the situation that you're in, then you are a prime candidate. Or deception. How many of you know that deception begets deception? Just like truth begets truth. Everything bears after its own kind, no matter what it is. Amen? Right now, before we go into our, our foundational reading, I want you to open your Bible, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 through 21, and then 23. And we'll go quickly through that. Because it's important that I set up the background for you. <coughs> Word of God says in Isaiah chapter 5 verses 20 through 21 and then verse 23. You can include verse 22 if you really want to, but it's not what I think I need to say today in regards to what I'm sharing today. The Word of God says, Woe unto them, hear me well, it's not me, it's God's Word. Woe unto them. Does that mean everyone? Yes. Yes. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Now right there, somebody with, with the walking in the gospel of relativity would say, well, it depends on who calls good good or what they call good. In other words, what is good to me is not necessarily good to you. And what is evil to you is not necessarily evil to me. That's relativity. But does God's <laughs> word support that? No, it doesn't. Not at all. God calls evil, evil. And God calls good, good. And God calls good, good. And God calls light, light. And God calls dark, dark. God calls bitter, bitter. God calls 
Sweet, sweet. In other words, God, his word is yea and nay. Right. If it's good, it's good. You can dress up a snake all you want, but it's still a snake, right? Yes. No matter if you put a dress or a pair of pants on it, it's still a snake, right? That's the same thing here. Woe to them that call evil good and, e and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. Let me say that again. That put darkness for light. There are people today, believers or professing believers, or churches who have fallen so far that they don't even recognize what is light and what is darkness. They merged the two and called it good. Called it progression, a progressive teaching, and it's nothing but heresy dressed up. God doesn't judge mistakes, He judges sin. And light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Verse 23, which justify the wicked for reward. I see that all over the place. I see the government doing that. I see churches now doing the same thing. And God's not going to stand for it. He's not going to stand for it. He said, well, where's the love, Pastor? The love that God has declared hung on the cross. The love that God has declared spilled out His life for you and I. The, life, the love that God has declared not only hung on the cross but was buried for you and I, suffered the judgment of God for you and I, and on the third day was raised up, not that we could stay in our sin, but that we would know that He and He alone is the only one that can deliver us and set us free by ransoming us, buying us back to the Father through His blood. And He didn't stop there. He makes 24-7 intercession for us because He's justified. Amen. Which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from Him. Verse 34 says, Therefore as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chafe, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. How did they do that, Sister Cindy? By calling good evil and evil good. By calling dark light and light darkness. By calling bitter, sweet and sweet, bitter. How did they do that? By being wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. How did they do that? Because they justified the reward, the wicked for reward, and took away the righteousness of the righteous from him. That's how they did that. That's what relativity does. And that's why I tell you that under the lie of relativity, deception is growing in the church. Under the lie of relativity, deception is growing in the church. Jeremiah 17, since we're in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 17. And for those of you who are only New Testament believers that don't even know how you can say that. You're either a believer in the Word of God or you're not. You can't be a New Testament believer without being an Old Testament believer because the Word of God is the Word of God. Amen. One is the womb, the other is the, is the production of, or, the, or the child. The proof of the womb, what was being grown in the womb, right? The religion of Judaism brought forth. And how many of you know that Christianity is not a new religion? How many of you know that Christianity is actually the birthing of Judaism in the right way? Don't get me wrong. Don't say, Pastor, crossing over into Judaism. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is God's religion that could not happen because of the weakness of our flesh. God brought forth the very seed of his law so that we could live that law spiritually. And that's what is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. For sure. So you understand what I'm saying? It's not Judaism. What I'm saying is the one new man. What I'm saying is without Judaism, you wouldn't have Christianity. 
And what I'm saying is because of Christianity, we are the ones when we're living unto the Lord that we evoke the Jude or the people of, of the Jews to jealousy. They want what we have. They're waiting for what whom's already come. They just don't know it. But because what has come, that's why I say the Old Testament is the what? The womb. And what is the New Testament? The Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. Amen. That's the way that you need to look at it. At least I hope you will. Because it shows you the power of the whole word of God. How can you believe in what Christ did without knowing the plan of God from the beginning? You can't. And it's too easy to be indoctrinated by the different fads, Sister Sabrina, that new or new revelations come about. How many of you know that there's no such thing as new revelation? The revelation of Christ has already been given, just like the Word of God says that Paul said. It was the revelation of Jesus Christ that taught him. Well, the Word of God is the revelation. Jesus Christ is the revelation. The Word of God says in Jeremiah, I think I told you what, 17? The Word of God says in Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10, Thus said the Lord, Curse be the man that trusted man, and make it flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the porched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabit. Blessed is the man that trusted the Lord. And his hope is in the Lord. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he come. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. The Word of God says in Matthew, go there for me. Matthew 24. This is when the disciples of the Lord God ask him some very direct questions. And Jesus didn't he haul around he told them the absolute truth. He told them that it was not about relativity, but it was about what the Father's word had spoken. The word of God says in Matthew 24, verses 11 through 13, it says that many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now I find it amazing that he reemphasizes that, Brother Jonathan, in verse 11. But that was the first statement that he opened up with the disciples in verse 4. He said, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. The question, the answer followed, Sister said, the little question that his disciples asked him. In verse 3 it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And the first thing he said, was, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. So why is it so important that I remind all of us that the greatest assignment against the body of Christ is not the world and is not Satan outside in the world. It's Satan inside the church through gospel, gospel I call relativity. Deception is growing in the church because people are no longer believing the Word of God is sovereign and absolute. They're believing that the Word of God is for meant to people in different ways. For some it's the truth, and for others it's not so much the truth. For some it is a figment of their imagination, and to others it is a doctrinization of religion. But the word of God says that Jesus Christ came out of the desert after being tempted. And the first thing that he did was, was pull up the word of God in Isaiah. He took the book from the minister, the word of God said. And he said, the anointing of the Lord is upon me to set the captive free. That hasn't changed. He didn't set the captive free by 
sugarcoating anything. He spoke the word of God. He spoke what God the Father told him to speak. He did what God the Father told him to do. And guess what? The Holy Spirit teaches us exactly what Christ taught. Because what Christ taught is what the Father taught. There's no breach in the word of God. So it says here, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Why does the love of many wax cold? Is it because the word of God is being preached? Is it because that I literally believe the word of God? Is it because I live a life that is in line with the word of God? Is it because I strive to live that way? Is that why so many people are turned off from me? Or turned off from the message of the gospel? No, it's because iniquity is abounding. That's why. Amen. Love is not what you think it is. Love is God ordained, agape love first, and filial love, and then Zoris love. When we have the sexual love in front of agape love, everything is out of order. When we say what the heart wants, the heart gets, it's out of order. Because the word of God said that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? And God says, guess what? I know it. This is not beaten down the church. This is causing, I want the church to rise up and do what it's called to do and be who we're called to be. The only apology we should make to anybody is when we speak in error and we first repent to God and then we apologize to the person we spoke to concerning that and we correct it. And that goes to anyone, I don't care who you are. And when our gospel that we preach Changes depending on who we like and who we don't like and who's our family and who's not our family. That's partiality and God won't stand for it either. Amen. That's why I say relativity is the root of deception. It is another gospel. It says in verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then in verse 13, it says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be stable. First Thessalonians. I well, say, Pastor, when are you going to get to the main reading? Not until I do. The Holy Spirit wants me to do this. Lay out the foundation for you. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. If you ever need a litmus test of what God's Word is, and what does, you know, some people say, well, you know, I, really, I'm not doing anything wrong. But God's word says this. It says in verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. How do we prove all things? The word of God, right? Well, yeah, but what if, what if God didn't write the Bible? Well, let me ease your conscience. God didn't write the Bible. God didn't write the Bible. He inspired the Bible. Men were his tool, if you will, his pen. The Holy Spirit was the ink. But the Bible says that all Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, by God. All Scripture. It means it's God breathed, it's Ruach. But when you understand that, it's like said, when people say, well, God's word it can be taken literally or not literally. It doesn't really mean what it says. Then you're saying that God's breath is not alive. And the word of God is alive. The word of God says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Does not the word of God tell you what he says is good and what is not good? Does not the word of God tell you what brings about destruction in your life and what does not bring destruction in your life? Do you think that our God is a God? Now, I've had some people tell me, Sister Jan, well, I don't want to follow your God. The God, you know, I, I want the, the God, uh, the Jesus God that is, is on the lighter side, you know, and he sat with sinners all the time and, and did what the sinners did. No, 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 no. He sat with sinners because nobody else did. He wanted to bring them the word of God. He wanted to bring them help. He didn't go to the bars with them. He didn't go to orgies with them. He didn't do all these things so that, you know, he was wanting to show himself a friend to sinners. No, he wanted to show himself a savior to sinners, just like he was a savior to me. 
Oh, yeah, but I'm pastor. I, I, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. He's mad all the time. He's never been angry. Only thing he's ever been angry at is sin. You know why? Because of what it does to people, his creation. That's why. You say, we well, yeah, but we all sin. Praise God. That's why we need a Savior all the time. Amen. That's why we need to acknowledge the fact that we can't save ourselves. And you and I do not have the right to bring God's into the low term of relativity depending on how your emotions feel and how your situations are. Anybody here want to talk about that? Well, Pastor, why do we need that? Why do we need to know God's word is not a respect to persons? Because no matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what you pray, no matter how you say, if God's word is not the cornerstone, if God's word, and I'm talking about not only the literal word, but the written word, if he's not the cornerstone, he can't be your foundation for your foundation of life. The cornerstone is what holds you together and holds me together. Anybody that knows anything about building anything knows that you have to have a cornerstone. Ephesians 5. And don't worry about it if I don't get finished with it today. I will finish it. One day or another. One time or another. Ephesians 5. When you get to Ephesians 5, look at verse 8 through 17. The reason why I'm showing you all these things is because whether it be in the Old Testament or the New Testament, whether it be the epistles or the gospels, they all say the same thing. God called good, good, and evil, evil. He called dark, dark, and light, light. And no matter how you break it up, whether it be in the Old Testament or the New Testament, God's word still is the litmus test for what God's will is, not relativity. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about in a moment. The word of God says, chapter 5, verse 8. It says here, for you were sometimes darkness. And I like the way it says it because it speaks truth. It didn't say you were in darkness, it says you were darkness. You were darkness. For you were darkness, but now are you light. See, it says that in a qualified mode. You were darkness, now you are what? Light. It didn't say you're in light. It didn't say you were in darkness. It says you were. It makes it a personal how you were. You were darkness, but now you are light. Look at the contrast. It says, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now, in this particular case, uh, again, this is. A foundational scripture for anyone preaching the word of God, anyone following the Lord, whether it be a pastor or whether it be you as a, a genuine believer, it says this, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. So when you declare God's word and you contradict what you just declared by saying, hey, listen, it's okay, you can partake of that and even bless them in that, but just make sure that they know how you stand. Well, that's, a, that's hypocrisy. How can you say how you stand and then bless that which you say that God has not blessed? It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake thou the sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools 
but as wise on purpose, redeeming the time, redeeming the purpose of the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. First John. 15 to 17. <clears throat> Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now we know it's not talking about people, it's talking about the mindset of the world. The folly of the world, the perversion of the world. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Wow. Well, I thought God was love. He is love. But a righteous love, a, a love that is permeating, a love that casts out all fear, a love that is real and just, a love that cares so much that he's not afraid to tell us the truth, to set us free so that we can love him back. In the right way. I love the Lord with, with gratitude. I mean, nothing but gratitude. Because there's not a thing that's in me that's of any good but what is wasted. And that gives me hope to continue to press in because when He started in me, I have the confidence that when He started in me, He was complete. Because <clears throat> He started it, I didn't. The Word of God says, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is what? Of the world. And the world passed away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, last but not least, I bring you to our text foundation. And I want us to look at our text verses, which are 11 and 12. Our text reading foundation is found in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 14. When you get there, say amen. amen. The Word of God says, Moreover, brethren, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, Corinthian church, a very fleshly church. He said, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all the fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Remember when I told you about Judaism, the religion of God, being the womb? Well, this is, this is what it's talking about. These are types of shadows. Everything that the Judaic religion practiced and still practices today is the outward religion, but not the inward result of the outward religion. You understand what I'm saying? We, uh, people get that wrong. They say, well, you know, Christianity is a new religion. No, it's not. It is birthed forth out of the womb. It's God. He didn't want a religion. He wanted a relationship. That's why it has to be birthed forth. It says, and I want you to understand this reading in context to what I'm saying. Crystal, good to see you. Christine, right? good to see you. Didn't mean to call you Christian. Christine. And we're all baptized unto Moses. Now that was the law, right? Unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Now look how he transcends. And all and did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the spiritual, same spiritual drink. Who was that in the Old Testament? What was he talking about? The spiritual meat and drink. Jesus. And this is why, this is the qualifier. And he'll, he'll see it. I don't have to kind of lead you to it. He'll see it. He'll just spell it out. Let me read it to you. And we're all baptized unto Moses, unto Moses and the cloud and in the sea. We know that's, that is the religion. That is the letter of the law, right? It says, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Now, how can that be? They just went into the baptism of the law. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ. Boom! The transition, smooth and to the point, from the womb to the child. 
from the womb to the life, from the religion to the life. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, and were some of them, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. A lot of fornicators in one time. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these say, he's not putting this here, Sister Sabrina, for us to say, oh my God, I don't have a chance. I can't know. He's saying, these things were written, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so that we can learn and not have to do those things that they did. So that we wouldn't have to learn through experience. That we would see what happened. And you know that, see, this is not gospel of relativity. This is the gospel of God. That if these things be practiced, this is what you can expect. And he said, listen, these things were written not to cause you fear, unless fear is in the right place like we talked about. This is not cause, causing you to feel, well, well the God of, of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament are two different gods. This is not to, to, to make you feel, well, you know, I, I can't enjoy life. No, this is so that you understand that God did what he did and does what he does so that we can enjoy life. The thief cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Lord says, I've come to give you life and life and more abundantly. These things were in place for that reason. He said, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. It says here, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and was destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition. And like you tell me what admonition means? Instruction. Instruction, yes. To teach us. Not to beat us up. Not to throw us in the corner and say we're no good, we'll never amount to anything. No, it's for our instruction. He said, listen, if you don't believe my word, see what happened to those that didn't know my word and acted out in disobedience. See what happened. I don't want you to do that. I've given you my word to he who's been given much, much is required. I've not only given you my word, I've given you my spirit. I've given you a new spirit. I've given you a new heart. I've given you the opportunity and privilege to experience a new life like you've never experienced before. I've given you the power and the authority and I've equipped you with the Holy Spirit so that you can look to he who's able to do exceedingly above anything you can possibly ask or imagine according to the power that worketh in you, not me, in you. And then he says, Wherefore, or oh, says, Upon the ends of the world will come, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Brothers and sisters, those two scriptures are your text. That you build, that I'm building this whole message on. It's not to condemn others. It's not to, to point a finger at this pastor or other people who have fallen away. It's so that we learn and ask God, why did they take a detour? What happened? How did they drop their gourd? So that I don't drop my gourd. So that I can stand firmly in the word of God. Not in self-righteousness. Not, not thinking that you got all that or I'm all that. No, in humility, understanding that God is not a God of relativity. He's a God of his word. And if he can't be a God of his word, then how can we trust our salvation to him? He goes on to say these other two verses there for you. But the two verses I want you to key in on is 11 and 12. It says in verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is 
faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but with, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. And then he says something like, it's out of the clear blue. It doesn't seem to add up, but then it does when you read everything else. It says, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. From the idols of your heart. Flee from the idols of your heart. You say idolatry, well, that's what idols are. See, the idol of someone else is not necessarily your idol. But I want to tell you one of the greatest idols in the body of Christ today. Say what? Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, one of the greatest idols. One of the greatest idols. It's pride. It it's stems from narcissism. Narcissistic. We, we seem to think that, that our problems are, are, are greater or bigger than anyone else's. That our circumstances and situations, you know, God's word may work for some people, but not for me. Because my situation is different. My circumstance is different, so therefore God's word is not applicable to me. So I've got, to, I've got to work out something else, you know. And I'll give God the glory after it works out the way I need it to work out. And God says, no flesh shall glory before me. But God's word says. You see, the biggest idol in the body of Christ. You say, well, no, that's in the world. No, I'm saying it's in the church. Because you see, what's happening, the reason why so many pastors and so many believers that once stood firm on the word of God are, are error. Right now, I'll give this, I pray for this pastor, but he's a type and shadow of many of us. We start to lean more and more conveniently to relativity concerning family, concerning friends, concerning different situations that involve people that are close to us. It's not that we don't, I believe in the word of God, but when it comes to them, it's, it's not as mm, tight. You know, we may say it, but you know, we kind of want to play, have some wiggle room there so that they don't feel, well, I want to make sure I don't close the door. Let me tell you something. You can't close the door no more so that you can open it. God opens it. God closes it. People close doors, not you. You don't close the door on someone else. When you share the word of God, people say, well, you know, I don't want to share the word of God in, in the truism of the word of God because it's going to turn them off. Well, let me tell you something. They were turned off to begin with. So the thing that you want to do is try to turn them on to the truth. Is anybody hearing me today? Amen. You see, it's not about that pastor, that Christian, that one not doing right or falling into error. It's when that error is deception that becomes delusion. And when delusion becomes delusion, then they won't hear the truth nor receive correction, nor conviction, nor chastisement. Deception doesn't live by itself. That's why relativity is the root to deception. Deception doesn't live by itself because its whole purpose and primary goal is to produce a delusional mindset. Word of God says, just to jump a little bit here, it says here, um, just to show you something, the Word of God says that Paul said this, a couple of verses down, he says in verse 21, he says, you cannot... You cannot, hear me, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Is that me saying this? It's God's word. It's God's word. Deception is an equal opportunity in volume. So let's take heed. Church, the first of all, as I've well documented it by now, let me back up a little bit and zero in on some points that I've shared with you that you may not have known that I've laid out a foundation for you. The first thing that I want you to understand is I want to open up, and I did open up with these questions. What is relativity? And secondly, what does it have to do with deception? I just told you. Relativity is the root of deception. It's another gospel. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Galatians chapter 1. I want you to look with me, if you will, in verses 8 through 12. This is 
Paul speaking to the church in Galatia. He says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, that is Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. He says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be blessed. What? Oh, he said, let them be accursed, not blessed, right? Okay, let's make sure, let's understand that. As we said before, this is not the first time that he dealt with this, apparently, okay? because he said this. And again, a lot of people will say, well, he's talking about the gospel of grace versus that of legalism. It's more than that. People want to cut it up into uh, uh, just a, a little black and white issue. It's not. It's about what the Word of God says spiritually, the context spiritually, and the depth. The Word of God says, as we said before, so say I now again. In other words, that's how important it is. He said it before, and he's going to say it again. If any man preach any other gospel, any other, that means several different ones, right? Unto you, that, that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men of God? This is where your relativity comes in at. Because when people want to persuade men, when they want to kind of snuggle up to men, they will preach another gospel. But when they want to be walking with God, they will preach his word. Or do I seek to please men? Or if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. In other words, it's not based off of relativity. When I share the word of God with you, I don't speak at you, I share it with you. I remind you that the word of God, as a believer, to me, and anybody that's a genuine believer should have the Word of God foremost, centerpost in their heart. Because the Word of God is a lamp under our feet and a light under our path. The Word of God warns us about the problem of sin and tells us about how valuable the law is to us in a proper perspective. The moral law has never been canceled. It has never been uh, disqualified. The moral law is based in the two commandments of God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You cannot love your neighbor as yourself until you have the first one right. And it says after that, all the other law and the writings of the prophets are housed in those two commandments. When people want to accuse you for, for being a legalist, a legalist is somebody that just speaks a word but doesn't do what they speak. A legalist is commanding people to do something in order to have a relationship. God doesn't command you to have a relationship, but because you've been set free, you do have a relationship. Therefore, you want to please God. And you want to serve God. The word of God says here. For I neither received a man. Neither was I taught it. But by the revelation. Remember what I told you earlier. A lot of people want to tell you. There's all kind of new revelations coming about. There's not. There's only one revelation. And Paul declared what it is. He says. For I neither received in a man. Neither was I taught it. But by the revelation of Jesus Christ. of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ the only begotten Son of God, the Father? Yes. Did Jesus Christ pay the price for our sins? Yes. Did Jesus Christ give us because of what he paid for? Now people say we have a free gift of salvation. I agree with that because you can't earn it. But it was not free, was it? It cost God, the Father, his only begotten Son. It was paid for. So it was paid for, it's a free gift to us, but does that say that because it's a free gift to us, by grace through faith, not of our works, lest we boast, does that mean 
that we are not obligated through thanksgiving and gratitude to live unto the Lord? Not because we have to, but because we desire to, we want to. And yes, we're challenged every day of the week. Yes, you're tempted every hour of the day. Yes, you make errors, but don't make your errors a rule of thumb and say, grace covers that. If you are in error, if you make a mistake, it's totally different, my brothers and sisters, than from sinning and sinning willfully. There's two different scenarios there. When you make an error, sometimes people want to go through the front door there that we lock after a certain time. So they go there, they turn, they try to get out, they can't get out. Why? Because it's locked. The door's open here. We don't condemn them because they try to go through the front door. We route them to where they're supposed to go. The word of God is very much the same way. There's some areas that are locked for a reason so he can bring us to another way, a better way, a way that is more prosperous, a way that is enabling us to stand firm. Deception is growing in the church and the reason why it's growing from the church is because it's being spilled out from the pulpit and people are loving to have it that way because it doesn't convict them where they are. They can say yes and amen and put their money in the, in the deal plate and all that kind of stuff and, and tithe and, and say well I'm good I did my obligation and go run outside and live like they were before and not having any, any concept of what God wants from them. And they're so easily tossed off of that platform of grace. Because you see, when you start acting out in relativity, you're saying exactly what I'm saying right now. Relativity becomes a new norm. And we see that, if you don't believe me, you see that in all the woke platforms that are, are here. That's all about relativity. When you see that about the abortions, it's all about relativity. Well, you know, you don't understand my situation. All that I'm talking about, when, when people want to contradict God's word, yet speak God's word when it's convenient, when people want to make it a showmanship or pastors want to make it nothing but a job and not a calling, then it's easy for them not to take heed. When in all truth and honesty, when pastors preach the word in and out and counsel in and out and people don't take the counsel and, and they constantly call them and say, but this is my situation, I don't understand, you know. And the father, he said, well, you know, it's like this particular pastor said, he said, does that person know how your stance is in Christ? Do they understand your faith walking? Do you understand that they don't conf you don't confirm any of this? And they said, yes, we do. And he said, well, then if, as long as they understand that, you can bless them. Is, is, is that right? That's, that's, a, that's an oxymoron. That's a contradiction. How can they believe you? How can they even respect you? If And that goes for all of us. How can people respect and believe that our faith is genuine if what we do, we speak one thing and we, we cancel it out by our actions? What does it have to do with deception? What does relativity have to do with deception? The easy answer it is the root of deception. Because when there is no standard of what is right and wrong, there's no standard of absoluteness or sovereignty. For all, for genuine justice and honesty, or honest rewards, brothers and sisters, the absoluteness and the sovereignty of God's word is the only litmus test and the only genuine justice that there is for all men to equalize all men, all people. Justice is had in God's word. Man's relativity has twisted and perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ to accommodate people as they are instead of reaching out to hand them something on someone that is able to help them 
live a life. I've told you before, when a pastor starts, or and I, I say a pastor, I'm not just speaking about myself or other pastors, I'm speaking about each and every one of you, because you're all, if you are genuinely born again, you are a preacher of God's word to bring the good news wherever you're at. The platform that you have is wherever you go. That is where your platform is. You don't need a pulpit to do that, but you need a foundation to do that, a foundation that is Jesus Christ, and not one that you, you made into your image, but one that God the Father has constructed very carefully through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, when Galatians 1, 8 through 12 takes effect, when there's other gospels being preached, it may not be stamped relativity, but if you look at it, if you stand back from the forest or from the tree, you'll see the forest. You'll see what I'm talking about. Everything that is coming about right now is basically about the gospel of relativity. Because when there's no sovereignty, then every man does what's right in his own eyes. And the Word of God says that in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, twice. Where the king is no longer there, and every man does what is right in his own eyes. When the word of God, the absoluteness of God's word, the, the word of God, the holy written biblical, the Bible of the, the will of the Father, when it's no longer respected and not acknowledged as the absolute word of God, the sovereignty of God's will, then that's why I said, where the king is no longer there, then every man does what's right in his own eyes. When the pulpit is not preaching the word of God as it's written, then how can the people that are sitting under that have any direction or guidance or any desire to stand firm on the Word of God? Not out of ugliness or absurdness or just arrogance, but out of humility because we know what God's Word has done for us. The Word of God, you cannot, I told you before, you cannot take fresh water and salt water and mix the two and say that you have fresh water. It's polluted water. What I'm talking about, brothers and sisters, is nothing new. And actually, it started. It started in the beginning. It was recorded in biblical history in the Garden of Eden to our first parents. And it continues to happen today, especially, and unfortunately, as I've been saying, more and more from the pulpit to the pew. In the book of Judges, as I just stated, the word of the Lord says in Judges 17, 6, and in Judges 17, 21, excuse me, Judges 21, 25, and Judges 17, 6, it says, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what? That which was right in his own eyes. Why? Because there was no sovereignty recognized as absolute standard right and wrong. That's what the Word of God is about. It's a standard of what's right and wrong. So with that said, let me just right now revisit the definition of relativity and how it relates to deception especially in today's culture of the church. The definition of relativity, by the way, if I move too quickly for you on that, is Judges 17.6, you write it down for your study, and also Judges 21.25 reiterated that same statement for a reason. That's how important it is. Church, the definition of relativity is this. It's the absence of standards the absence of standards of absolute and universal application. That's the technical definition. Let me read it to you again. It's the absence of standards. In other words, the Word of God tells us what is right and wrong. But when that is absent, there's no universal application. You know what happens in Sister Serena? iniquity abounds because there's no application of universal standard of right and wrong. That's what happens with relativity. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Yet God's word has never changed. And I'm going to find a place to stop because I'm running on time. But I mean, let me tell you, I'm not finished with this message. I just cooked you a little bit of toast. The word of God says he has never changed. He says his truth is absolute and that he is sovereign. 
in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 9 through 13. The word of God says, Let all the nations, that means all the people, be gathered together. This is a, a challenge ushered by God Almighty. And let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this? And who among them can show us former things? Let them bring forth their witness that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is true. You are my witness to say the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen. Why? That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. Wow. I have declared and I have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God, small g, among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Boom, again. Yea, before the day was, I am he. Boom, again. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? And then Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So therefore, relativity has no value when it comes to the Word of God, is it? Because relativity is about our thoughts, our emotions, our situations, our circumstances, our narcissism. <coughs> but it's not about godliness. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper the thing wherefore I said it. And you can understand where he's saying this, and if you want a cross reference for your study, in the New Testament, just write this down. Write 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And also write 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. That's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Second Peter, I think I told you, Second Peter 1, 16, right? Yes, okay. And then Second Peter 1 through 9, Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. That's what I want. Amen? I want to clarify that. Brothers and sisters, as I try to bring you to a place of intermission, let me say this. In today's churches, if believers from the pastor on down are compromising God's word and making it appear less than what God has meant it to mean, then someone has got it wrong. Someone has got it wrong. And I'll be bold enough to tell you some God concerning life, death, and eternity. In our theme, I said, deception is an equal opportunity employer. We all need to take heed lest we too fall. It's for a reason. Because I know that as time goes on with any of us, just like with this pastor, just like with you and I, when we've been walking with the Lord, really in a genuine way for a long time, sometimes the things that we held really fast to, we kind of let fall on the wayside. It's not that we don't recognize them as truth, but we don't put them as a priority. And what we don't realize is when we let them fall on the wayside 
and they're no longer a priority, everything hinges upon everything else. God's word is line upon line, truth upon truth. So when we let certain things fall on the wayside as not being really that important, yet it's the word of God, yet it, it affects us in our walk with God. When we let it fall on the side, we are actually in truth letting the belt of truth that holds up our whole armor slip down to your knees and you start to trip and fall. And you start to compromise. You start to lean on other things that are not of God. On other people that have not have wisdom from the world giving you counsel. But it produces nothing but narcissism in you. It produces nothing but the world and the lust of the world. You say, well, not all counsel from the world is bad. I'm not saying all counsel from the world is bad. I'm saying when counsel from the world, world is not enthroned or rooted in the word of God, it doesn't produce anything that's of God. It produces that which is of the world, no matter what. I've been on both ends of this. I know what I'm talking about. Deception is an equal opportunity for him. And as time goes on, the Bible says that many start to scoff at the idea of judgment and of Jesus returning. Because after, after all this has been talked about before, have not you heard it before? Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. We need to get our lives right. We need to get our houses in order. How many times have you heard that before? How many times have I preached that before? How many times in the late the last year has people preached it? Not too many. Not anymore. But I'm preaching it. And what I'm saying is, when I tell you to get your house in order, get your life in order, I'm telling the church, church, get your church in order. Get your life in order. Pastor, get your church in order. Church, get your pastor in order. Be one voice, one heart, and one accord. The sovereignty of God's word is not for the poor folks. It's not for the lowly or less intelligent. It's for every saved person that declares Jesus is Lord in their life. Deception is growing in the church. And it's up to us to do something about it. We need to stop Allowing Greek mythology to take over the pulpit. I said Greek mythology. The Trojan horses that come in the church. Accepting the world. Oh, oh my God, the world's starting to like us. Well, that's a shame. Because we're becoming more like the world than the world is like the body of Christ. I've heard all the excuses. Oh, there's nothing but a bunch of hypocrites in, in the church. That may be so. But there's always room for one more. So come in. Let's hear the word of God. And let that hypocrisy be broken by the word of God. Let the spirit of conviction convict us. And if need be chastise us. So that we might be ready. That we might be people that are looked forward to the coming of the Lord. Not out of fear. But excitement. That our children can know that there's a power. That is able to set them free. That the sick know there's a power to raise them up. That the church is not about just coming in here, a pastor, just ran and raved, but hear the word of God radiate through power and might and reach the darkest soul in here. Yeah. My calling is to preach to the body of Christ. So that we'll get stirred up. So that we'll speak to our dry bones. So that we'll prophesy to our dry bones. And better yet our dead lives. Our places in our lives that have not risen up to meet the call. And understand that God is telling us. Prophesy to your life. Prophesy to the areas in your life. Don't compromise. you got a son or a daughter. That is not abiding in the word of God. Speak to them in love. But always in love with the truth. You got family members? Don't treat them differently than you would treat anybody else. Speak the gospel. 
the brothers and sisters, let me close with this. If you're going to speak the gospel and not live the gospel with joy and excitement, shut your mouth and bridle your tongue. Because you just cause that brother or sister to believe what you're telling them is all about relativity and not about power. Father God, we come before you today and I thank you, Lord, that your word will not return void. That it will find a heart that's been plowed up, Father God. Not out of condemnation, Father God, but maybe conviction, Lord God. That we might rise up, Father God, as a people, Father God, humbled in your presence, but excited because of your presence. Knowing, Lord God, that you will do in us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And Lord, I thank you, Father God. I thank you, Lord God, that by your spirit, we are led into all truth. And every man and every woman will be held accountable for their own lives. Not only for what they share, but the word of God says every idle word will be justified for either we will be justified or condemned but that also speaks about what's going on in our hearts, Lord. Oh, Father God, I yield to you. I surrender to you. And I thank you. And Lord, I cling to you. And I embrace your word. And I'm excited for what your word has done, will do, continue to do. And all those who not only declare it, but decree it as an amen. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, amen. Would you give God all the glory?